So welcome, everyone. My name is Dula Fora. Uh, I work as a data warehouse engineer at King, working on the streaming platform. And this is my friend, Martin Balashi, who is working uh, as a researcher in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. We have done a couple of projects together in the past on stream processing, and we really love to give talks together. So today, we're going to talk about large-scale stream processing in the Hadoop ecosystem, or in other words, open source stream processors. Some of you may have already heard some talks today about this topic, and we're going to set the record straight here. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but really, we are. So yeah, but actually, uh, our approach uh, is that we're actually going to look at some more complex streaming use cases. That's why we say large scale. So I'm going to th start the presentation uh, with saying a few words on some harder streaming use cases just to motivate the further discussion. So let's talk uh, about a use case that we have at King. So the problem that we're trying to solve with the streaming system is that we would like to uh, compute real-time player statistics. So imagine that we have the mobile games like Candy Crush, Bubble Witch. They produce a lot of events, like tens, tens of billions of events every day are flowing into the system. They come through Kafka, and now we want to process them, accumulate some state per user. So this is a very hard problem. This, the use case sounds very simple, but it's a technically, it's very challenging. So as, as I said, we have billions of events uh, every day for about 30 million uh, active users. So imagine that you're keeping any kind of statistics per player. This quickly grows in the, the range of terabytes. So any strictly in-memory solution will uh, fail like pretty quickly. Also, we don't just want to do some very simple things. Uh, that's not enough for us. We want to do as complex analytics as we want. So basically, the data scientist should tell us what we need to do on the stream. And of course, this application comes with strong consistency guarantees. So repeating events in a, in a system which can only guarantee at least one semantics is not good enough for us. Another typical use case of a telecommunications uh, company uh, would be uh, to receive the, the data coming from uh, the network and maybe do some spatial visualization on it. So let's say we're receiving call data and we want to do a heat map of the dropped calls to show which area is more affected than the others. And this is, of course, uh, also a very hard problem because the data rate itself is, uh, is very high, gigabytes per second. Then also, if we uh, want to do some more clever analysis, we probably want to enrich our data stream with a huge uh, state. Uh, so, so the analytics that we're doing is actually dependent on, let's say, around one terabyte of enrichment data. And also, for this uh, use case, we might want to express some complex windowing logic to actually detect uh, these uh, troubling situations, for instance, session windowing or, or something like that. So these are just two examples of a broad class of problems that today's streaming uh, frameworks uh, face. So let's, let's look at the tools that we have today in the Apache ecosystem. So in the last two years, the, the streaming space has exploded. Now we have a lot of choices uh, of frameworks. Uh, now I'm going to start going through each of these systems and give you a short description of uh, some major features of, this, of, the, of each of these systems and maybe give you some uh, strong use cases for each of them. So in other words, when to use each system. So I'm going to start, about, start with Apache Storm. Uh, we can say it, it used to be a pioneer of real-time analytics. It has been around for quite a while, and it's widely adopted in many companies. It has a, a simple distributed data flow abstraction. Users 
program in a low-level API against this distributed data flow by implementing sources uh, called spouts and processing operators uh, called bolts. Storm is also, uh, of course, improving as time passes and has recently added many uh, more high-level features that we have seen from other stream processing systems, such as uh, support for time windowing or some basic state management. While this is supported, uh, it's not uh, as mature as we will find in other systems that have actually uh, developed these abstractions much earlier than Storm. So when would you actually use Storm today in a production environment? Well, a strong point for Storm still is that it has very low uh, latency guarantees, so very, low latency pro pro very low processing latency uh, for the elements. But you need to keep in mind that uh, the at least once guarantees that Storm can provide you might not be acceptable for your application. And also writing very complex analytics pipelines might be very hard in the low level APIs. So next system is Apache Samza. Well, we can say Samza is a step forward uh, from Storm and it builds heavily on uh, Kafka's log-based uh, philosophy. Uh, in this sense, it decouples uh, the processing tasks in our topology by connecting them with resilient message queues. It was designed to be pluggable in this matter, but it works best with Kafka. It also has a very uh, amazing feature, uh, which is a scalable operator state, a key value state abstraction that internally uses RocksDB to store uh, huge key value states. Uh, this comes, in very, comes very handy in many real world situations when we would like to build up some like, key value state logic in our applications. So if, you go, go, if we go back to the example that I gave on the, on the King use case, well, the player statistics is exactly this kind of uh, key value state logic that we're looking for here. We're not using sums on, that's what I am. I said this, but. What? How is the latency of some uh, Well, of course, if you push everything into these message queues, it, uh, it will grow a little bit. But I would say it, it's still fairly low. It's in probably in the tens of milliseconds range. Okay. Yeah. So good, good use cases for Samza uh, is when you want to exploit this uh, key value state abstractions. For instance, when you join your streams with large enrichment data, or you build up a large key value state from your streams. But also in, in this case as well, you need to keep in mind that Samza is also can only provide uh, at least once processing guarantees. So you might get duplicate uh, state updates. Well, which, which might not be a problem in many cases if you just put into the store, but if you read and put, then this might lead to duplicate uh, state updates. Uh, a related system to Samza is Kafka Streams, which is a streaming library built directly on top of Apache Kafka. The feature set is, of course, very similar to that of Samza, but it has uh, a much nicer, higher level uh, API. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. When would you use Kafka Streams? Uh, basically, when you would have used Samza too. Uh, but also, a little bit of advantage here is that if you have a, already a Kafka-based data infrastructure, building very small processing jobs with Kafka Streams um, is, very, uh, is very handy. Because in many, many cases uh, in your company, you really just want to take the right to small Kafka consumer and look at the stream. In this case, Kafka, Kafka Streams is an ideal uh, choice. Next system is Apache Spark or Spark streaming. Spark takes a radically different approach to stream processing than all the other systems that we're going to talk about today. Spark does unified batch and stream processing over a batch runtime by creating small uh, batches of data from the stream, called micro-batches, and then scheduling short-lived batch jobs on them. This, while this provides good integration with batch programs, it suffers a little bit on the streaming semantic side in the last year, there has been a lot of uh, 
advancements in the streaming APIs for expressing complex state and windowing logic. And due to the, the runtime, to the non-streaming runtime, Spark is, is struggling to keep up with the streaming advancements. But of course, uh, the Spark guys are working hard on making uh, these things work there as well. But it's, it's much harder for them. So when would you use Spark? Well, Spark, is still very, Spark streaming is still very well suited for simpler data exploration. So if you have this notebook style uh, lo computation logic that you use for bash programs, you can probably use Spark streaming as well and combine it with your existing uh, Spark analytics. What you need to keep in mind here is while this uh, provides exactly one's guarantees, the latency you get here is much higher than in the other systems. So you need to make sure that your use case is OK with this. Are we sure that they're coming with a new streaming engine, or is it more uh, on the API side, the improvement coming with uh, It's actually both. So they're reworking a lot of uh, the streaming, uh, a lot of the parts of the streaming runtime. So it's also API and also runtime. So next system is Apache Fling. Similarly to Spark, it also does both batch and stream processing, but it does it on a native data flow runtime. Uh, it's safe to say that Flink has become the leader of open source streaming innovation, and concepts like uh, windowing and handling complex stateful applications uh, have been done first in Flink properly. So if you've seen the, the Storm talk there, they talk about how they have added st the state abstractions. Uh, and actually, the algorithm uh, they take there is an adaptation of Flink's algorithm. But Martin will cover these details later. So Flink comes with very, uh, highly flexible windowing and state abstractions. And also some very nice features, uh, such as save points, which let the, user, let the user stop a stateful streaming application by saving the state of a Flink program at a specific point in time and then re later redeploy the application from that exact point while keeping the exactly one semantics. This comes very handy in production settings where you will uh, inevitably deploy uh, programs with bugs in it. So it's very nice that you can actually stop your program, fix it, upload a new jar, and start it over again from the safe point. So when would you use Flink? I would say Flink is a, is a very good candidate in almost any cases where you have more advanced uh, streaming analytics use case. So in other words, for all the heavyweight streaming jobs. Of course, if you want to use complex state and windowing logic, such as uh, session windowing, or complex event time, or custom window logic, then Flink is your only uh, choice. And also, it's really easy to tune the, the throughput latency trade-off in Flink uh, by, by configuration. So if you want to, if a slightly higher latency is OK for you, you can get incredibly high throughput. But you can also uh, slightly decrease the throughput for a very low latency. The last system to talk about is Apache Apex. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have, uh, uh, how many of you know the system. It's fairly recent in the Apache uh, Software Foundation. It's been open sourced by the company called Data Torrent. Uh, Apex is a native streaming engine built on top of Yarn. From, from its abstraction point of view, it's similar to that of Flink. Uh, so I would say this is the closest system to Flink uh, out, of, uh, out of the five systems. It also has stateful operators and, uh, and thus checkpointing to HDFS for fault tolerance. So it also has exactly once uh, processing guarantees. But <laughs> in contrast with Flink, Apex only has a very low-level API, so it's much harder to program uh, for the, the regular developer. It's more suited for, uh, for engineers who have very, very good Java knowledge. It has some nice features, such as advanced partitioning schemes and some locality optimizations to, uh, to push the performance even further. So when would you use Apex? Well, Apex is also suited for advanced streaming analytics. So if you don't mind writing the low-level API, uh, you can try. Also, if your use case have very low latency requirements uh, and that is not satisfied by systems like Flink, 
you might try it in Apex, and I'm not actually sure uh, whether it's going to be better or not. Also, Apex comes with a, an extensive operator library that has already also been open source with the company that uh, open sourced the runtime engine. So maybe your use case is already covered by one of the operators that you find here, and then this might become a nice off-the-shelf solution. So you need to check this for yourself. All right, so these were the systems uh, that we will cover today. And uh, now we're going to uh, dive into more of the details on the runtime and the programming models and how they do checkpointing. Here's a nice table of comparison. I'm not going to spend time on this because you can give a talk on just this slide. Uh, I invite everyone to look at this table uh, after the presentation just to let it sink in a little bit. It's going to be up there. So let's look at the runtime engine of these systems because while these, all these systems looked uh, slightly different, they're also pretty sim similar in, in many, many aspects. So we'll actually talk mostly about two different runtime uh, architectures, the native streaming data flow architecture and micro-batching. So first, we talk about native streaming, which is uh, these systems plus Kafka streams. So in the native streaming, the data flow architecture, we have, a long, we have long standing operators continuously running, and they consume the event, event streams uh, practically one by one. Uh, and these operators can hold state. Uh, and yeah. So going back, so basically we have a topology uh, a directed acyclic graph. In many cases, it's also possible to create uh, some versions of cycles in this processing graph to, to support some feedback and data flow. We, we got pipeline execution. Uh, yeah. So what are the advantages of this uh, architecture? So one, the first thing that is not obvious at first is that this, this architecture has full expressivity for the applications. Meaning that in this uh, uh, in this engine this architecture, uh, you can express any computation, be it batch or streaming computation, uh, with a little cleverness. Also, due to the pipeline execution, this naturally provides a low latency, low processing latency for the incoming elements. And also, we get stateful operators by default, as everything is up and running all the time. We can keep state there. So what's the problem with this? Well, fault tolerance is hard in these systems. Martin will talk about this, how uh, the different system can achieve different uh, guarantees. Throughput may suffer if we're not careful uh, with how, how we actually implement this data flow. Uh, but this is actually not a huge concern as systems like Apex or, um, or Flink are completely in the same ballpark as uh, with, the, with Spark streaming, maybe even faster. Load balancing could be an issue, because if you imagine that we have this topology and uh, elements are throwing, uh, uh, flowing through, if the data distribution changes, we, we need to be clever about how to add new operators or change the partitioning schemes. Uh, uh, this is a problem that is not uh, solved very well uh, by the current uh, streaming systems. There, there are some uh, ideas like partial key groupings in Storm, but I wouldn't say they are battle tested or uh, they work very well. So on the other side, we have the micro batching architecture, which is also stream processing and in, in a broad sense. So we have the records coming in. They're grouped into small batches. And we, ha we have a scheduler that schedules short-lived batch tasks on each uh, of these micro-batches. So what are the features of this architecture? So computation is broken down into time intervals. And uh, by time, I mean actual wall clock time. Uh, we can, of course, do load-aware scheduling here, because we get the chance to schedule a new job for each micro-batch. If the data distribution changes, we can be clever about it. This is not something that is already implemented in Spark, uh, but it, I think it's an upcoming feature. Uh, and also, this architecture gives a very straightforward way of interacting uh, with batch programs. 
as we already have these small batches. So some advantages, it's easy to reason about. Uh, it has a high throughput because we can batch everything. Fault tolerance comes for free uh, using the same algorithms that we had for batch. And we can do dynamic load balancing uh, that adapts to the changing data distribution. Disadvantages, well, the latency, of course, depends on the batch size. And it, it, get can, it can get quite high in the order of seconds. It has limited expressivity because we don't get to observe events one by one. And this design is stateless by nature. We, it's hard to uh, keep operator state when we don't have any operators. So we actually have to work around the state uh, problem in, in a very different way. All right. And with this, I would like to give the word to Martin. Thank you, Gila. So we are going to um, continue with the programming models. Uh, so what, what are you facing? What are the APIs that you have at your hand when you actually try to uh, program against these systems? And practically, we have two very uh, different <coughs> levels currently that we would like to talk about with an honorable mention. So Anyway, what uh, these uh, systems boil down to is uh, a topology uh, uh, directed acyclic graph, sometimes cyclic one, uh, which is at the bottom of the slide. That's what we would like to achieve eventually. So we have our operators and those get parallelized uh, among the cluster. You either program directly those, uh, which should be this spout or bolt or, or task level, what you get in Apex, uh, or Storm or Samza, or there's another bunch uh, when that Flink or Apache Beam or Apache Spark offers you where you have this declarative uh, functional API where you think in transformations. And uh, that's, very, uh, that's quite different the way you actually program these things. I would also like to add that, of course, some uh, what we are seeing currently, if you have seen the uh, Julian's uh, stream as uh, SQL talk quite recently today is, for example, on top of these uh, APIs, it's very natural to, to add other higher level APIs as well. That's why we have this figure like this, because practically, uh, when you look at these uh, APIs, they actually get translated to something like this as well. So if you wanted to program Spark at this level, actually you could that's just not the public API. So that's really a level up uh, if you look at uh, the APIs like this. So another uh, nice notion that we have been seeing uh, very recently in the streaming space is uh, Google uh, open sourced uh, the uh, Google Cloud Dataflow, uh, at least the API as Apache Beam where you get one unified API, which is actually very strong when it comes to expressing windowing. Maybe that's one of the, the nicest features of the API, and they have a, a very definitive paper explaining how the API works and how they implemented it. So you can use that as a service via Google Cloud, or there are on-premise runners, namely in Flink and Spark, where you can actually achieve most of the features that are in Apache Beam, uh, and the Beam community has uh, published some information on what are the features that each of the runners uh, actually do for you. Uh, of course, the, Google, the native Google Cloud uh, Dataflow runner does the most, but uh, when you have a, a specific application, you can choose from the list which one you want to go for if you don't want to use the service. So. When it comes to API, of course, we need to look at a little bit of code. And bear with me, we are going to use the word count example, which is, of course, infamous, and everyone has seen a lot of it. But it actually has a couple of features that we can discuss and, and see how these systems can implement them. So one remark, of course, word count is about the frequency of words in an incoming text. But first things first. We don't even have a finite text to count in streaming. Our data is infinite. So even the semantics of a word count program are slightly different than in batch. Of course, uh, you can do it two ways. Either you have a so-called window word count in which you break down your computation into finite pieces on which you can do the same thing. 
or you can have the so-called rolling word count implementation, which means that whenever you see a new word, you, emi uh, you increment the counter and emit the, the current value. And actually for rolling word count, usually you need some, let's say a hash map, where you would store the current count. And uh, that's tricky in a streaming system, because if your node fails with this hash map, what happens? That's what Jula mentioned, this operator state. So are we, we are going to touch these small bits while uh, skimming through the, the API calls. Let's start with Storm. Of course, uh, the basic way to implement uh, a Storm DAG would be the f following. They call it the topology. And implementing the word count, of course, you have a, a spout. Then you have a splitter, which uh, from sentences uh, gives you words. And then you group by uh, the words and then set up a counter. And actually, um, the counting bolt would look like something like this. It has this hash map. Well, Storm 1.0 came out yesterday or the day before yesterday, if I'm not the day before yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, and they have added a new feature in which you uh, you could instead of a hash map use something that is actually checkpointed and gives you uh, at least one semantics. So that's something that we could have added onto this slide, but this is the basic idea of how this should look like in Storm. When it comes to Samza, they also ha uh, have an interface that Eula has mentioned for storing these key values. This is again a rolling word count where we need this, some kind of the hash map like uh, interface. But they make sure this is also checkpointed to, to Kafka to give you at least one semantics and uh, assembling the topology looks fa uh, fairly similar to the previous one. As we have already mentioned, Apex also gives you an API similar to this, but I would like to mention that, of course, in Apex, usually you would actually construct a topology uh, via the data torrent API, which is a, a visual solution. So you wouldn't have to code this most of the time. So let's see. OK, this was the, the lower level API, which is some of the times it's, it's beneficial to program at this level, because you can access everything. And it's nice to build on. But what happens if you? don't want to deal with all these low-level stuff. You want to crank out code a little bit faster. Maybe use a little more Scala syntactic sugar. So we are now switching from Java to Scala as well. And we are going to store our words in a case class here. And when it comes to these higher-level functional declarative APIs, all we need to do is a flat mapping for the splitting. Uh, we were going to unwrap our data in a word case class. Then we key by the word, sum by the frequency, and that's it. If instead of rolling word count, we need a windowing one, all we need to do is to add the time window in between. Well, that was the Flink solution. What about the Spark solution? The window word count is naturally almost the same. Actually, it's even more concise because of Spark's uh, pair RDD solution. The rolling word count is a little hefty. And what's, what's the reason behind that? Well, actually, it's the runtime. Because we don't have these long-running operators with which we could implement our long-running hash maps. So what's the solution? All uh, what uh, the Spark guys came up with is, OK, I'm going to have a separate D stream that's going to store my state. So I have my data D stream and this separate uh, stream for the state. And the way I'm updating my state is, I get the current data and the previous state, and I apply a function on those from which I can get uh, the current state. That's basically the logic behind it. And of course, if you implement that function, then, get, uh, then they have this nice API call map with state. They didn't have this uh, uh, when we uh, were evaluating Spark for the first time, but now it's a new feature as you see this uh, topic is, is developing really fast with a lot of quite messy innovation all over the place. So uh, updating these kind of metrics is kind of tricky. But we are very happy that all the systems are, are adding features by the day. And a minimalistic window word count in Apache Bay, uh, Beam would look the following. It has a little more boilerplate, 
because the basis of adding operations is the so-called apply function. In an apply function, you could do something like a flat map, or you could also do something like a counting. On, its, on the declarative level, it has a little more boilerplate, but it's practically the same. OK, let's get to a little more meaty part of the talk, fault tolerance. Everyone is concerned with fault tolerance in streaming systems, and rightfully so. Uh, and it's a little tricky question. Basically, when you look at it, fault tolerance is inherently more difficult in the streaming system than in the batch system. Why so? Well, usually you run a streaming system as a service 24-7 and you want low latency. So what happens if failure occurs? You cannot simply restart your job. That's just not an option. Maybe it has been running for a year, then you will get months of latency in getting your data back. That cannot happen. Maybe you need that data with 100 millisecond latency. So how do you solve this problem? Also, when you are actually talking about fault tolerance, you need to consider a lot of things. Of course, you cannot have any single point of failure, something that we could have in Hadoop 1, that uh, there the, the job tracker could sometimes fail, and of course that was fixed, that th couldn't happen in a streaming system because without a job manager or a job tracker, how is your topology going to be running or how are you going to address it in any way? Uh, there are different guarantees or different consistency levels, uh, at least once, exactly once, and they, they are very different. And of course, we need to talk, uh, consider these operator states that we have been talking about uh, with, um, with EULA. So one of the uh, first solutions was uh, Storm Record Acknowledgement System, but practically the idea is that you track uh, the way the tuples descend through a topology, you, you track where they actually are and what tuples they have triggered. Uh, the algorithm is uh, quite clever in the sense that it's, uh, the space it requires, it's not linear with the size of your topology, but constant because it uses a probabilistic algorithm. So that's the basic at least one solution behind the tuples in Storm. And they have uh, the day before yesterday, they have came up with this new release where they also have a solution for at least once processing for the operator states based on uh, the ABS algorithm. How about SAMSA? Dula has also mentioned that it also provides at least once uh, semantics. And the way it provides that, of, uh, it has a different notion of the stream. Practically, it says that the stream should look the following. It should have a couple of partitions. And in each partition, you should have offsets. So all I have to do, I have to remember my offsets in each, each partition. And if a failure happens, I ro roll back to the last state. And this is the same in Samza and in Storm. If some bad thing happens, you restart from that point in uh, Storm. The way you do that, you just replay the record. So if it doesn't finish, you replay that single record. In SAMHSA, if a failure happens, you start from the latest checkpoint. So if you checkpoint it here, then a failure happens here, you start from here naturally. When it comes to Spark, uh, of course, uh, the MIDI batch architecture has some challenges when it comes to implementing windowing and things like that, but one, it's very elegant of a solution when it, when it comes to uh, fault tolerance because it is already there by the batch solution, so I wouldn't really touch that. It depends on the batch solution and, at, and it's great in, in that regard. The way Flink solved this, and uh, this is the algorithm that I was uh, referring to as the ABS or asynchronous barrier snapshotting algorithm, is that you actually inject a logical time uh, into your data, and whenever this uh, checkpoint barrier, this logical time arrives at an operator, you, um, you block on that input channel, await all the barriers from all other inputs, and whenever this arrives, then you know that, well, I have reached this logical time. Now I'm going to 
uh, actually checkpoint my state because the main uh, issue here is to m make sure that you can coordinate in a distributed system and you do that with these checkpoint barriers in this algorithm. It also uh, features pluggable state backends. Of course, when uh, you actually start checkpointing it, you can have uh, different solutions where to checkpoint it and how to clean that up and how to compact the state. Apex uh, also comes with a, a checkpointing algorithm which is uh, quite similar to Flink's solution, but it actually checkpoints more, so it is faster in the recovery. So, usually people want to see numbers in, in talks like this, and we felt that we might not be the, the best choice to, to actually put them out here, because there are plenty of benchmarks out there, so we gave a, a couple of references here. Actually, our uh, last 10 slides are going to be just a hell lot of uh, references that you can check out after the talk. And basically, the point that I wanted to make is how much these choices matter for your business. And there's a blog post from a guy who was previously em employed by Twitter, and they did a, a nice job with one of these systems at Twitter Hack Week last December, and it turned out because of the architectural changes that the two system, that the legacy solution had and the new system had, they managed to bring down uh, the the machine requirement to one percent. That was because changing, doing the right decision between two systems. So I would really recommend reading that blog post and all the other ones explaining, benchmarking these systems, because they c it can be really tricky, and, well, you would need at least one separate talk to, to really go into details. So, what's up for next steps for stream processing? Of course, there are a couple of things that are lacking, and uh, we put some of those on the slides. To be enterprise ready, and uh, I think a couple of these needs would be dynamic scaling and rolling updates. So you can really run 24-7. State handling real, uh, still needs a little more refinement, and I think streaming is also extending into the libraries category, like complex event processing, machine learning, SQL, you name it. But of course, more integration in terms of either Beam or batch integration would be very welcome by the community in general. So, as for closing, uh, seeming, uh, the streaming systems are gaining insane popularity and uh, the scene is seeing a lot of innovation so choosing the right system is, uh, is really a difficult deed so we hope that we could help you a little bit with that and actually at the end of the slides uh, we have a lot of recommended reading and of course that's for you folks so you can check it out and we are happy to hear back for your opinion and hopefully have a great conversation on that. Thank you. And we take questions. Yes. Which one did you choose? Well, for the King use case, we chose Flink and it is working perfectly. The telco use case was implemented both in Spark streaming and Flink streaming, and for different input, it proved diff uh, different system was was the best actually. So, yes, please. Sorry. No, we we haven't used that. So, so the question was whether all of these uh, support Kerberos, and I think the, the uh, uh, answer to that is not yet. You, uh, yeah, it, it depends on the, the system. The, the ones that are more mature do uh, support Kerberos, and I think it's an upcoming feature in, in a couple of those. I, I didn't get the last part. How does the state part work with? Fault tolerance problems when you have you know, state from uh, the state, the state. Yeah. So, so if we go back to the. 
Yeah. So, uh, for instance, in this use case, uh, in this uh, Flink case, uh, the algorithm works in a way that uh, we inject these barriers into the the stream, and whenever operators receive these barriers, they take a snapshot of their operator state. So that's when the state from Flink is saved to an external storage like RockDB or MySQL. And this, this might happen uh, synchronously or asynchronously depending on how this can be implemented in the external system. Uh, well, if it happens synchronously, I mean, uh, yeah, of course, if it's a huge state and you actually need to have uh, like a synchronous copy operation to save it, it will slow it down. But uh, keep in mind that this uh, this is happening asynchronously in the different operators. So it's not happening. It's not like the st uh, stop the whole world operation. It's happening at different times uh, in the streaming system. So actually, the runtime impact of this, even though that it might be a synchronous step, is very low compared to something uh, that stops the whole thing. Yeah, and giving, uh, going back to high availability, the point is that from that point you have uh, written that out, you only need a handle that you need to replicate uh, between the, the job managers to make sure that you, can, you will be able to access the state, which is, of course, small, and that's how it works. Yes? Yeah, I, I think all of these systems have very good tooling around both Kafka and HDFS. I mean, those are like industry standard systems that everyone is using. So I don't see that. I, I don't think that you will find like a major difference of the support in, in any of these systems. At least for Kafka and HDFS, of course, yeah. it can be a difference whether a system uh, supports five or. 15 or 50 systems, but Kafka and the HDFS are the most basic ones. Yeah. Right, I think we're running out of time. So we'll take the further questions offline. So thank you again. Thanks.